Um, the questions I'm going to ask and attempt to answer are, first of all, why is banking so important for the economy, for society, um, for a sustainable type of development, uh, particularly of local communities? We have had a, a good overview, so I'll be brief on this, but uh, my tag on what causes the recurring boom-bust cycles and crises which are very costly and disruptive. Which policies or banking systems have actually empirically been uh, shown to be most successful in avoiding those problems, particularly the boom-bust cycles? Um, so therefore, what kind of banking system and banking policy do we need? And once we solve that problem, while we're at it, can we solve the rest of the world's problems? Actually, you'd be amazed by how much you can do with uh, the right banking and monetary system. So I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at, at some of the, the major problems that Europe is facing beyond um, what you may be thinking of. And of course, there's opposition to the things that we've been saying. Um, and instead, other agendas are being pushed, so just to make you aware of those and, and um, um, you know, how we need to argue against those. So, very briefly, why is banking important? Um, together with some students from Frankfurt University, I did a survey of over a thousand respondents, so it's you know, statistically quite um, valid and representative. The question was, who do you think creates and allocates the majority of the money supply. And to make it easier, there was a choice of possible answers. Um, since this was in Germany, actually, it wasn't just the central bank, there was, you know, there's the ECB, there's the Bundesbank, you know, so we had all these choices, the government, but also the banks, and then capital and financial markets. Because you see, the newspapers always write about how the markets are creating wealth, you know. So somehow, uh, that should be an option too, I guess. The global financial architecture, infrastructure, anyway, we gave them a lot of choices. And what was the result? 84% of respondents either take the government or the central bank, one of the central bank options. So it's the, the general public believes, well, it's, it's the government or the central bank who are creating and allocating the money supply. Now, that's quite a reasonable expectation. That is our common sense understanding of how the system surely functions. Well, um, this is not how it functions. Um, so the answers given by the public are wrong. By the way, in this survey, there's actually more questions than that, and one of them was also the question, would you agree with a financial system whereby private profit-oriented enterprises create and allocate the majority of the money supply according to their own decision? So over 90% said no, we wouldn't agree with such a system. And of course that is the answer to the, the question, why don't people know more about how the system works? You see, if they knew, they would not agree. So as we've heard, banks create the money supply and they do this when um, people borrow money. So if you go to the bank and you take out a bank loan, the bank will pretend that you have deposited the money. And that's how they'll fill the accounts and nobody can recognize it. That's effectively how the money supply is created. Because they're the accountants of all the transactions that are not taking place in cash, which is you know, 97, 98 percent of the transactions, anything bigger tends to be non-cash. They're the accountants, and who knows what they're doing? Well, they have a clever way of uh, making this appear correct if you wanted to, to look into it, but essentially the borrower um, is credited with money that's called a deposit, but nobody deposited it. It's invented. So the banks create fictitious deposits, um, 
and that's how the money supply is created. So historically, if you go back into how this system came about, it it um, it was fraud. There's no doubt about that. Historically, and of course, as the bankers became more powerful, they started to help you know write the laws. And so today, technically, many lawyers would argue it's not illegal what they're doing. Doesn't mean we shouldn't um, try to challenge it legally. Uh, that's another topic. Um, there's actually some grounds in which one, one could um, challenge the system legally. Let's also think about, as we mentioned, crises, uh, about, well, where's our money safer? Um, you all know probably somebody who's used a stockbroker before to buy or sell stocks. And of course, when you do that, you have to transfer your money to the stockbroker. And before you give the order, the stockbroker is holding your money. And um, especially in an era of negative interest rates coming up in many countries, something to think about, you know. Um, you know, it may not be such a bad place to have your money with a stockbroker not invested. Um, but anyway, let's just say you happen to have cash with a stockbroker. And let's just compare that with having cash in, well, what we think is cash with the bank. Where's your money safe legally? What's the legal status of your money? If it's with a stockbroker, two possibilities. So that's a quiz for you. Do you think it's owned by the stockbroker? And so, of course, if the stockbroker fails, they've got a problem, you know, they made some mistakes, they're going bust. Does it go under with the stockbroker? Do you then litigate in order to extract your money or what's left? Or is it held in custody and therefore if the stockbroker goes down, um, it's, it's not going to uh, be affected? So what do you think? So who's, who's going for option A? It's owned by the stockbroker and there's at risk if the broker fails. We have a few here. Who's going for B? Also have a few. Okay. Um, before we come to the answer, let's look at uh, question number two. Do the same thing with the bank. So if you give your money to the bank, it's called a deposit. Um, is it owned by the bank and therefore at risk if the bank fails? Who's going for that option? Okay, quite a few or B, it's held in custody and therefore not affected by the failure of the bank. Okay, so we're all aware of the reality in the banking system where the bank, um, the money is owned by the bank, it's not really a deposit, it's not held in custody, it's not a bailment, the bank owns the money, you just general credit to the bank. But with a stockbroker, that is not the case. With a stockbroker, it is held in custody and therefore it is Safe. Keep that in mind. So let's look at this um, legal status. Some of the trade secrets of banking. The unknown legal realities of the banking business. Number one, banks do not take deposits. And number two, banks do not lend money. So what happens legally when a deposit is made with a bank? Legally, the customer has no money at the bank or on deposit but it's a loan to the bank. There is no such thing as a bank deposit. It's just the banks are borrowing money from us. The depositors are lending their money to the bank. And what the bankers proudly call their huge amount of deposits is just their debt. That is the bank's debt to society. So they've always been very good in putting a very positive spin on things. They're really debt artists. Number two, banks never lend money. Unlike normal firms, in the case of normal firms, insurance companies, uh, they do lend money, but not banks. What banks do is they acquire securities. They purchase securities. So you go to the bank and you say you want to get a loan. Um, the bank will make you sign a loan contract, a loan agreement. Legally, that's considered a promissory note. And the bank is purchasing that. Of course, it also says that um, the bank should now 
pay you something, but the bank will not pay out. It will just record its debt to you, which is called the deposit, and we use it as money. Isn't that handy? So they don't actually have to pay up, and they do not pay up. So the way it works on the balance sheet is that the loan contract, we're obviously not talking about the thousand pounds here, but a thousand million pounds here. So on the bank balance sheet, um, this looks like the, the amount of the loan, say a thousand pounds, this is the value of the security that the bank is purchasing, is therefore shown on the asset side, if the bank is buying this, and therefore has more assets. And then it shows its debt to the borrower as a liability. Technically, it actually has an accounts payable liability from the loan contract because it should pay out. It is, and this is where I think there is actually a good reason for a legal challenge, it is misrepresenting this accounts payable liability as a customer deposit, which is a different type of liability. And it's misrepresentation because the customer didn't deposit this, and the bank didn't deposit this. Nobody deposited it, it's, it's invented money. Okay, trying again. So this, this is shown here. And so when you see the, the amount of money as a borrower in your account, um, this shown as a liability to the bank, um, was just invented. It wasn't transferred from any other account inside the bank. It wasn't transferred from any other account outside the bank. This is how virtually the entire money supply is created. What's not created this way is cash, notes and coins. But that's only 3% of the money supply in most countries. Um, so the non-cash money is entirely created by the banks. This, of course, can be quite handy, just to give you this example. In 2008, and, and many people have this question, well, hang on, if banks create money, well, how come they can go bust? Of course, they do have to make the books um, balance, and since you know the system is already pushing things, that can get them into trouble. But this case of uh, Credit Suisse, and it seems also Barclays Bank, um, is quite instructive. So September 2008, as you remember, the global, the so-called global financial crisis, where it was a European and U.S. financial crisis, um, a lot of banks uh, were bust. They needed capital. So Barclays and Credit Suisse, same case, it seems um, they needed around seven billion pounds in new capital. So these banks and Credit Suisse, basically it's not disputed with Barclays. Barclays sort of tries to indicate that, no, no, this is not what happened. So, um, I mean, consider the story mainly about Credit Suisse, but it seems that it's very similar in the case of Barclays. Um, they thought, well, since we're really inventing money, why don't we invent our own capital? To do that, you need a straw man. You need another counterparty outside the bank. Um, and of course, you know, if, if we're talking about seven billion, and you invent money by getting somebody to borrow this money, because you, you, you know, you need a fairly large counterparty. So why not the oil sheiks and in the Gulf states where banks like Barclays had fairly close relations and dealings. Qatar, it turns out, uh, was willing to engage in the discussions and was persuaded to um, buy newly issued shares of Barclays. And when you issue shares, you raise your capital. But Qatar said, we don't want to sell our stock holdings, the stock market has just crashed, um, and we don't have the liquid funds, and Barclays said, well, no problem, we lend it to you. So Barclays um, prepares the loan contract when Qatar signed, Barclays purchased the loan contract of Credit Suisse, um, and that's recorded on the asset side of the balance sheet. Then you have an accounts payable liability. Um, the lender owes the borrower the money, so accounts payable liability, 
you then swap that, as banks always do, into a deposit, customer deposit that nobody's deposited. And then you do the liability swap of issuing new equity, which is also on the liability side, and you transfer the deposits um, into equity. And there you go. Now you've got seven billion more in, in equity. Of course, this is illegal, um, so it, it is a case for the serious fraud office, but it seems not a very urgent case at all. And as I said, in the case of Credit Suisse, the regulator said, all right then, okay, you know, we'll, we'll let you do that, but next time, don't do such naughty things. What about other forms of money, cash? roughly 3% of the money supply. What about this quantitative easing that people are talking about? Well, this, when central banks inject money into uh, financial markets or into financial institutions, this is done through uh, the central bank crediting the bank's accounts at the central bank. And it's the same game. You know, so the, the banks have accounts with the central bank, and the central bank purchases things from the banks and credits their accounts with the central bank. Now, what is that credit? What sort of money is that? Well, that's, again, invented money. But it's a different type of invented money. That These are reserves um, held at the central bank. They're called reserves. And it's, it's like the, the bank credit that the banks invent the deposits, but it's always at the central bank, so it never circulates. It can't be injected into the economy. Now, um, since the money supply is created, and allocated by banks, that does make them pretty powerful because they make the decision how much money to create and who to give it to. And the shocking thing is that, I mean, this has been going on for centuries, nobody seems to have thought of sort of encouraging, to put it mildly, the bankers to do the right thing. Maybe, you know, Think about the implications this may have, whether you create money, certain amounts and give it for certain project or another type of project, will of course, over time, reshape the entire economic landscape. And Ireland has seen quite a bit of reshaping, I believe, in the, in the past decade or two. Um, there are no such rules imposed on the banks. In fact, the regulars are saying, no, your job is to maximize profits. Turns out they then focus on particular types of activities that are particularly harmful because that's how they maximize their profits. Now, the problems in banking in such countries like the UK, um, you know, the UK is, is a good example because it's really the, um, the historical origin of this type of financial system. Modern banking was created in the 17th century in the UK. Um, when we look at the UK, we notice that key problems have already been recognized for the entire last century. You can go through a string of str government report, commission report, and expert report, this, that, and the other, for the past century, dozens and dozens of reports. They always conclude the same thing. Um, say, Macmillan Committee, 1931, um, they had you know, this was a um, parliamentary uh, committee and they, they invited um, testimonials from bankers, all sorts of um, concerned parties, and the bankers seem to have been reasonably honest, you know. They told them, well, you know, um, when customers of other banks come to us, we turn them away because we don't want to poach other banks' customers. You know, that's an agreement between us banks. Um, Economic historians have actually uncovered those written documents where you have these written agreements. There's a circular that was going around, it was found later, uh, 1938, uh, quote, it has been agreed by the clearing banks, this is the cartel of the big banks, that in the present circumstances and until further notice, probably it has never been given, no bank will take an account from another bank. Um, now, one has to, in fairness, point out that there's always going to be collusion in banking. And that's related to the way banking works. 
banks need to cooperate to do their job. And when you have to cooperate, then it's, it's a small thing to move from cooperation to collusion. Um, and that's in the clearing of transactions. In the UK, it's particularly obvious because it's a private group of banks, They're the clearing banks, what used to be called the London Clearing House, private, you know, the big banks. Um, but we've heard, of course, all the court documents in the last uh, six years about one market after another being fixed and rigged by the big banks. So it's not a surprise. But keep in mind that this is where banking is, is different from other industries, and that has to um, have implications about how banking should be shaped. So if you buy a BMW, the BMW makes the cars actually fairly close to where I was born. It's the biggest factory in Bavaria. That's the B in, in BMW. And they make the cars. You buy them. Okay, you drive them. That's BMW. And you can get a, an Italian car, Fiat, or you know something like that. And it doesn't affect the BMW. Fiat can produce their cars and do what they want with the cars, and you drive them. There's no connection. But with banks, it's different. If you go to your bank, your bank can't do its job and you know, do its business without cooperation from the competition, from the other banks. It does not work if the other banks don't cooperate. So the BMW doesn't work if there's no cooperation with fiat. It's quite extraordinary, really. So, that means we have to really think about how we structure this industry because it's clear you will get a lot of collusion and cartels. But you can go further back. You can go back to 1918, so a century back. The Colvin Report, another committee, Treasury Committee um, in, in London, studied the banking system and the problems and concluded it's, it's a problem. It's dominated by the big five. When you read this, you think it's like <laughs> they get this century wrong. Um, and what, what are the problems? Well, there's lack of competition. The big five dominate everything. They do not provide loans to small firms, and they do not provide long-term loans, only short-term lending. Well, <laughs> hasn't changed in a century, has it? Um, in the UK, the degree of concentration of the banking system has been particularly shocking in the last century. Um, and this happened basically from the, the late um, 19th century onwards. There used to be many banks, also a lot of local banks, regional banks, community banks. They disappeared, amalgamations, mergers. They got very concentrated, and that's very bad. So that's recognized. Um, Looking at the landscape of banks today, we see that, um, of course, in the UK, they continue to be highly concentrated. There's, there's only 133 banks in the UK. Uh, there's a way of measuring the statistically the degree of concentration, this index, Herfindahl Hirschman Index, um, HHI, is the sum of the bank's squared market shares. And we get a reading of 1,600, 1,700. Now, anything above 1,000 in this index is concentrated, and anything around 1,800 is highly concentrated. Now, you have to take out of these 133 banks those that are not actually operating um, for UK customers. Maybe many, there's many large international banks that operate offshore and international transactions. Um, so in that sense, they're not really UK banks. Take them out, so you're left with 121 banks, and of course you are well above 1,800 in terms of concentration um, of banks. And that's true for assets, um, for loans, and for deposits. So it's, it's one of the most highly concentrated banking sectors. The figures would be probably not too dissimilar in Ireland. Uh, but I haven't studied the, the detailed figures. If you look at another European, well, in fact, if you look at all the European countries here, this is EU uh, countries and the number of banks. What you see is that Germany stands out 
to the, the tall bar here is the German, um, the number of banks in Germany is the number of banks. Um, it's followed by Austria, and then Italy, and then Poland. These are all places where there's been a tradition of community banks. Well, the tradition is shorter in Poland, but you can see how you can create that tradition um, you know, after the fall of, of communism. Um, France is another one, and here's, here's Ireland, where there's uh, still a, a decent number of banks. Now, it turns out that the more banks you have, um, the less likely you're going to have these problems. Sorry, yeah, please. What are you measuring here? Because this is just the number. Surely Ireland has 400. <laughs> it's the number of credit institutions. Yeah, that's credit unions. So, in credit unions are included, yes. That's, yeah. That's the starting from our point of view. We, we think we have two and a half banks. I entirely agree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, these are the official figures. Um, this is what you get uh, by the ECB or EU. Are they separately than S? Are they all just, are you talking about the number of billions? So it's a different target. Um, it's, well, you have to check their definition. Um, I think it's this number of separate legal entities. But the point is, there's some countries that have a lot, like Germany, and I want to look at those closer. Now, in Germany, therefore, the degree of concentration is far lower. So this index, HHI index, um, for total loans is below 400. I mean, that's pretty unprecedented, you'd think, if you compare to other um, countries, if you compare international banking systems. Um, so, there's less concentration and as a result there is more competition. The big banks always say, oh, concentration doesn't mean, you know, there's, there's no competition, but that's frankly uh, a dishonest argument. Concentration is very closely correlated with uh, competition. The more concentrated, the less competition you have. So, in Germany there's a lot of competition and a lot of choice for um, customers. So in Germany, we've got 1,600 um, community banks and a few other big banks as well. Now, all these reports where the banks, uh, the UK banking system was studied over the past century, they did not include a comparison with a country like Germany or even the US. And it's been argued by the big bank leaders that no, you shouldn't look at Germany, that's um, it's just so different, and also, by the way, it's on the local level, it's as concentrated as the UK banking sector, <laughs> um, which is quite a ridiculous argument. Um, you can debunk that by looking at the um, at a, a regional um, banking system, such as the Bavarian banking sector, and you find that your HHI index is still 400 and something, so very low. Now, briefly, what causes the recurring boom and bust cycles and what is the role banks are playing? Banks create the money supply and you can divide uh, the money creation into two streams. You may not be aware, but not everything is in, in GDP. We talk about the economy and the need to have GDP growth and so on, and the, the media report uh, the latest GDP growth figures, but GDP actually um, includes very specific things. Um, let's call it the real economy. What it does not include is financial transactions, asset transactions, property transactions, the housing market, the trans transactions, they are not included. The reason for that is actually fairly um, sensible because <laughs> GDP, the, the fundamental definition is value added, value added transactions. So that's the verdict by the statisticians on the financial sector, on the financial transactions. It doesn't add value. Uh, why? Well, it's a zero-sum game. If you're gaining through a financial transaction, somebody must have lost the same amount. It is a zero-sum game. So the more people are playing financial markets, or asset markets in general, uh, the more unproductive the economy gets, because in total, it plus minus zero. You're just 
it's divide and rule, just playing people off against each other, they're betting against each other all day. <laughs> um, anyway, so we've got these two types of transactions. And the, the money supply and the money creation, which takes place through bank credit, as we saw, C, bank credit, credit creation, needs to be divided into these two streams. So credit for the real economy for GDP, that's real circulation credit, and credit for transactions that do not contribute to GDP. Um, Non-GDP transactions, financial circulation credit. What you then can identify is the good credit creation and the bad credit creation. First of all, bank credit for financial transactions, this is the, the box here at the bottom right, asset credit creation. It doesn't contribute to GDP, but it, it has an impact. When banks lend for um, the purchase of ownership rights, which is what it is, asset transactions, somebody's purchasing rights, ownership rights, then because this is also money creation, this bank lending is money creation, you are creating new money and you're pumping it into one particular market, asset markets, financial markets. What has to happen? Of course, prices there have to rise. And that's the asset inflation. This leads then to boom-bust cycles because as the asset prices rise, more people want to take out loans, the banks are happy to, um, to fuel that. But it's very fragile because if asset prices fall, only by 10% the entire banking system is bust. But of course in the boom time, as we also heard, asset prices rise by much more than 10%. They can double, triple, quadruple housing prices, stock prices, and um, from that peak, if you then just have a, a retrenchment of 10-15%, um, you will get non-performing assets, and the banks cannot take many of those because they have so little equity. The equity is that, uh, is, is that part of the balance sheet that is, has to be used to make up for losses, for non-performing assets, and it's far less than 10%. So, banks are quickly bust. So if you have bank credit for financial transactions, which of course are unproductive, uh, it's also unsustainable and will result in banking crises and recessions following that. Um, if credit is used for consumption, of course you get consumer price inflation that's also unsustainable, unproductive. But if credit is used for productive purposes, investment credit, um, you can have growth without inflation and without financial crises. And that's true not just when you have high unemployment to start with and then you increase productive credit. It's true even when you're at full employment. You can still have more growth um, without inflation. We won't have time to go into details if you're interested perhaps in the Q&A part. Um, but it has to do with, with what it actually means to have growth. It is actually an accounting fiction because any physicist can explain to you there's no growth. Um, you know, how can there be growth? Energy exists and can't be created and you can't add to it, you can only transform it. So it's an accounting fiction created to suit the banking system, surprise, surprise, but maybe we have time to return to this. Now credit for non-GDP transactions, financial transactions, um, therefore creates these asset bubbles and crises and just a few examples how this, how this works. Um, so in Japan, this credit for real estate was only 15% of banks lending in the early 80s and then that doubled to 30%. Um, and of course that's the percentage of total lending while total lending itself also exploded. So we had a massive, massive credit bubble. Um, but it's, it's nothing new. This has always happened um, in other places like in the US in the 20s, Scandinavian countries in the 80s, uh, the, the so-called Asian crisis with the same banks lending for non-GDP transactions, property, UK, Ireland, Portugal, Greece. If you want to see what, what happened in Ireland, on this graph here on the left side, we've got um, the pink line is GDP, so it's fairly modest, nominal GDP below 10% naturally, but bank credit was expanding by 
you know, between 2004 and 2007, around 30 percent. And it, you don't have to be a so-called trained central banker to know that if money creation is expanding at this pace, way ahead of the real economy, well, by definition, you know, it's not going into the real economy. It's not in nominal GDP, right, because that's much lower. It must go into asset markets. And it's always the same story. So it's, it's quite obvious and quite easy to predict then, well, this is an asset bubble and you're going to have a banking bust um, as a result. Same, of course, in Spain, 15, 20% growth um, of bank credit, Portugal, Greece, similar stories. So which policy has been historically most successful in avoiding these cycles and crises? Um, the East Asian economic miracle, which is recognized by by anyone really, even the orthodox economists, um, was due to bank credit creation being mainly used for productive purposes. Um, this was done in Asia first by Japan. Japan introduced it into first well, Manchuria, which is now part of China, uh, Korea and Taiwan, which were part of Japan in those days. Um, and those countries after 1945 then continued these policies because they, they saw that it's quite effective. Uh, China adopted this from 1982 when uh, Deng Xiaoping traveled in, in Japan and they explained to him how they um, had this high growth um, period. It was a system of credit guidance where the central bank uh, tells the banks um, which sector to lend to or not to lend to. So, in particular, it was forbidden to lend for unproductive purposes. So, no consumer loans um, and also no asset loans. You could still get a mortgage, but it wouldn't be from a bank. It would be from special, non credit creating institutions. In other words, you have to use existing money for asset transactions because then you don't get the negative results of using new money creation for asset transactions. And that worked really well, 10, 15, 20% growth for, well, several decades, and these countries just um, developed tremendously quickly. Obviously, they, they didn't look at environmental concerns, so that's something you can, one can easily improve on. Um, it wasn't a goal but the same system of credit guidance can be used to achieve almost any result. As the Japanese central bank showed us, you can also use it to blow up the system um, and destroy those, uh, those, those banks and, and the traditional Japanese economy as they did in the 80s um, when the Bank of Japan used the credit guidance to force the banks to increase speculative lending. Similar to how the ECB, of course, um, encouraged the Irish banks to expand um, property lending in Ireland. So remember, I mean, some people say, well, credit guidance, that's too much of an intervention. But remember, credit is always allocated. There's always a bureaucrat making allocation decision. This is what the banks are doing. It's only at the moment, nobody's ensuring or even trying to encourage them to do what could be more beneficial. And with a credit guidance system, you just make this very explicit. And obviously, you should be very transparent and accountable. Um, the alternative is to take away the power to create money from banks and give it to the government as a positive money is advocating. But I would be very cautious about that because the central banks have an absolutely horrendous track record. Um, sadly, from any, after any crisis, they increase their powers and this has been true of the recent crisis, they're far too powerful and unaccountable. We should not give them any more power. The centralization of power needs to be countered. Um, this has been um, a major trend in the last century. What we need is the opposite decentralization, devolution of power, and that has to be especially true of the power to create and allocate money. So if you think about how we can do that, um, the power to create money belongs to the people. Um, as we heard at the outset, um, and it needs to be returned to them. And in, in, not just on paper on, on the surface, but in reality, and this can be done in a few ways that, that I'll discuss in a minute, but it shouldn't be given to central bureaucracies. 
Um, I've got a bit more on the East Asian miracle. We can return perhaps if you're interested in the in the Q and A. Now, the credit guidance is, however, not the the only way to do this. In fact, if the credit guidance system is abused by the credit allocators, central ones, uh, then that's also bad. And this is the the risk with the centralization of power. And Japan is is really a great warning. Um, concerning that, the Bank of Japan abused that power from the 1980s to cause tremendous damage to the Japanese people in order to further an agenda that came from the outside to change the economic structure and you know, a structural transformation, deregulation, liberalization, privatization, a whole neoliberal agenda that's being pushed by central bank. So um, there is an alternative. You know, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't introduce the simple credit guidance in the form of just forbidding the harmful bank credit. We could always do that, and then you don't need an active credit guidance. You just say, well, no, banks can't lend for um, consumption or asset transactions, full stop. You know, that's enough, actually, for on, on this topic of credit guidance. Um, but there's an alternative, and one should combine that. Germany was not directly implicated in this, or not very much affected, in fact, by the 2008 crisis. And you look at how closely bank credit and nominal GDP growth were in line. So during that period, the 2000s, you did not have an asset bubble. They're working very hard to create that now, but that's another story. So why was that the case? Well, it has to do with small and medium-sized enterprises. And you will have heard this German word, Mittelstand, which is medium-sized enterprises family firms. Um, why do they matter so much, these small and medium-sized enterprise SMEs? They do have a big impact in aggregate. Their total investment, uh, capital expenditure, um, in, in most countries will be 20%, 30% of the total. So that's substantial. But even more importantly, they're the main employer. Uh, in the UK, they account for 65% of employment, which is a low figure for an industrialized country. In most other industrialized countries, 70%. Japan, up to 80% um, of all employment is accounted for by small and medium-sized enterprises. And of course, they they have a, a job multiplier. They create more jobs. So if you give 100,000 euros to a small firm, and you compare that to the effect on, on job creation, giving the same 100,000 to a multinational corporation, maybe also based in Ireland and Dublin, which one is going to create more jobs? Well, this is the trouble with scale. When things get too large, they, they lose the, the human connection. And um, therefore, it's very important to support small scale activities and small scale enterprises. Now, small firms are entirely dependent on bank credit. They can't really get access to capital markets. There's lots of talk and, and PR about private equity funds, venture capital, and angels and all that, but it's really a drip, uh, drop in the ocean. They're still dependent mainly on banks for funding. So how can we ensure that banks will fund SMEs, as they should, clearly? You know, job creation, productive economy, less speculative lending um, uh, you know, activities among small firms. So what structure of the banking sector has achieved something similar to the Asian window guidance without active guidance? What type of banks are prone to lend to large-scale financial speculators? Well, you can do an empirical examination as we did 15,000 US banks. It's the large banks. In fact, you can skip that and just use your common sense observation. Um, there's a basic rule in banking which we verified empirically using this very large U.S. banking system with 15,000 banks. It's very consistent. Large banks lend large amounts of money to large borrowers. Likewise, who lends to small firms? Small banks. And that's been the recognized problem recognized for a century in the U.K. The, the big five don't lend to small firms. Now, you'll never get them to lend to small firms. Um, if you are Lloyds Bank with a thousand billion pounds balance sheet, you want to grow by 5%, you have shareholders, 5% is probably a modest target anyway, so your loan book needs to grow by 50 billion every year. So you've got a choice. You can give out 20,000 pound loans to 2.5 million 
small firms, family businesses, that would be good for the economy. Or you cut 50 checks to um, hedge funds and private equity financial speculating funds. They are borrowing a billion each from banks, I mean, in fact, more than that. And you're done. Which one are you going to do? Well, we know what the banks have chosen. So SMEs don't get the necessary funding from the banks. Um, there's also insufficient funding for um, green economy and grassroots um, community-based um, initiatives. In fact, what's been happening with concentrated banking systems, or also Ireland, where there's effectively very, well the big, the small number of very large banks dominating banking. Um, a lot of the deposits are taken from local communities and given to the money center, the big banks, eventually, where they're being lent for financial speculation. So really, there's a drain of resources from the local communities, the capital extraction, um, which is, of course, harmful for local communities. So what's true in UK banking is, I'm sure, also true for Irish banking. The objectives of the banks, which essentially is the big banks and the communities, do not coincide. The centralization of bank operations, branch closures all across the UK. Um, they don't want to deal with their customers, actually. Uh, they just want to focus on their large-scale uh, customers. Um, they focus on unproductive financial lending because you can get the big numbers, the large scale, and you extract money from the regions. Um, but the alternative is what we saw when I showed the number of, of banks in, in the EU, the largest number of banks in Germany. There's 1,500, 1,600 community banks there, and they account for 70% of banking measured by deposits. These are the uh, Sparkassen, local, public, semi-public, um, banks here, 43% of deposits, and then we have 27% are local corporate banks. They are, in Germany, they're full-blown banks. They do everything that banks do. You could call them credit unions, but, well, um, they operate as full-blown banks, but, you know, and, and locally. And they're all locally controlled, this 70% of banking, and not-for-profit. All the money stays in local communities. And of course, they also pay taxes, unlike big banks that operate schemes not to pay taxes. So local banking, of course, is popular because local small firms get access to finance um, and at good rates. Depositors get competitive rates and the community gets a bank that has the same goals, um, pays local taxes, pays taxes in general. Um, you have job growth, local banks, also, in Germany, they do uh, many training schemes, apprenticeship schemes, which businesses benefit from tremendously. Um, and depositors know, well, my money is going to benefit the local economy. Um, now, it's very powerful to set up a bank because with, you know, if you use the, the way the, the system operates for your benefit, you can have a big impact. So if you can raise, say, 20 million euros to set up in a local area a community bank, um, then within three years that bank can have um, 250 million euros in, in lending. And that will make a big impact. When I talk to local authorities in the UK who are supporting us in our project to set up community banks in England, um, they always think of these, the initial capital needed, you know, 15 million pounds, 16 million, um, as something, oh, so we have to put this in regularly, don't we? It's like an annual budget. No, 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 just once. It's very hard to get to understand. No, that's enough. That's it. You never have to put in any more money. Just once, you set it up, and then it becomes self-sustaining. In fact, it will, after a few years, pay you dividends if you get local authorities to be, um, you know, shareholders. So this is money available for local communities. So the solution is a network of local, small-scale, not-for-profit community banks. We model it in, in England quite explicitly on the German example, which the City of London hates. So I mentioned it as much as I can. Um, 
I mean, they've, they've worked very hard in the city of London to keep community banking out of the UK for 200 years. As you can imagine, we have a lot of resistance from the city in our work. Um, of course, there, there's no speculative lending, mainly productive lending. Um, and also, the structure needs to be designed so that you prevent takeovers of these banks. Um, it's a tried and tested business model. This is really the true secret of German economic success the last 200 years. I mean, there have been wars, disasters, crises, plenty in those 200 years, but the economy has fundamentally remained strong. Why is that? Well, because the small firms, um, which are the main employer, have been fully supported by the many, many local banks that lend only to the small firms in their local area. Um, they're committed to local sustainable economic growth, um, and while they're not for profit, it, banking is profitable. You just need to make sure you keep those returns in the local community. Um, there's no banker bonuses. Also, in, in the community banks we're creating in England, why should there be bankers' bonuses? I mean, there's just ordinary salaries um, for what should be actually an ordinary job. Um, and of course, the, the community needs to have a sense of ownership of these banks. So let me just quickly tell you how we're doing this in England. Uh, we've established local first community interest company with the goal to establish community banks. Um, and we're starting with the area where, um, where this, this group of, of supporters, where we're based in Hampshire, it's also where Southampton is. My university is also one of the supporters. Um, the Hampshire Community Bank, which is due to launch next year, focuses on SME lending, lends productively, local deposits are used for local economic growth. We have also a, a green part of the uh, portfolio for um, uh, the green economy, green growth uh, program. And the idea is simply that this local banking will serve as an engine for local growth. Together, very similar to the, the Sparkassen um, model from the Sparkassen study for Ireland, um, there should be more of those banks, of course. Well, we have to start with one. And by having shared back office and shared IT, then we get additional scale economies. We, we're setting up Hampshire Community Bank, so we're not dependent on this. Um, but it's likely to happen and will be an additional bonus um, increasing the the effectiveness of um, of the bank, the community bank. We got some government money, seed money to start. We've already lent out to SMEs a million, close to a million pounds. You don't need a banking license for that. Um, and in fact, if you do it correctly, perhaps you can avoid a banking license altogether, but that's another story. Because remember, what's regulated is deposit taking, but there is no deposit taking. Everything is a loan. And of course, lending, trade credit, is unregulated. So if you structure it correctly, there's a lot you can do, actually. But we're, we're going for the banking license. Um, it does make stakeholders happier. Um, and it's probably um, the, the better way to, to expand this model in the long run. Um, so we've raised 8 million in total. So far, we want to raise another 8 million in the coming year. Um, we started out by getting funding from publicly spirited investors on purpose uh, to make sure, you know, it's clear to everyone this is for the public benefit. So we, we got the funding from local authorities and also the universities in the area. Um, and they've, they've um, supported this. Now we're raising the second half of the money from other investors. Um, there's some insurance companies whose corporate social responsibility programs are quite interested. Um, we're talking to various other investors. But all these investors can only get half of the bank for those shares. Uh, half, the other half, is owned by a charitable, charitable foundation, which has in its constitution that the, this ownership, majority ownership of the community bank is inalienable, can't be sold off. Um, and the idea is that this will always serve as a, as a way well, to prevent takeovers, but also to ensure that the benefits of the community bank um, are 
going to be with the local community. The charity will um, hand out half of the profits of the bank for charitable purposes in the local community. Um, this seemed quite useful and suitable for the, the legal environment in the UK because in Germany the Sparkassen they have their own laws. Of course if you want to go down that route it will take years to pass laws to establish a similar system. Uh, the Volksbanken, Raiffeisen, People's Banks, um, Cooperative Banks, they also have laws that um, establish this whole system of cooperatives and it's in, in Germany has a long tradition um, and it's a fact in the UK the regulators have never given the banking license to a cooperative and to try to be the first one could also mean further delay. So we thought with this structure we get the benefits of the German model um, for the sort of um, for the UK legal environment. Um, so there's many benefits. I think we've mentioned this. Let me just talk um, and, and try to round off the presentation by talking about a few different angles now. So what about the idea that we centralize money creation allocation and give more power to central banks as a lot of campaigns including positive money um, are, are arguing. Um, central banks have, as I mentioned, have a lousy track record. They have not created money for the public good for, well, maybe, maybe not ever in some countries in the past, but certainly globally not for many decades. Over the last um, 40 years alone we've had over 100 banking crises, um, almost all ultimately caused by central banks that have the know-how, the data, the information and all the tools to prevent this but they've never prevented it. Um, so the ECB oversaw the creation of these bubbles in Ireland, Portugal, Spain and Greece um, while it's at the same time the most powerful central bank in the world. It could do anything. You know, if you look at its statutes, there's no government that can tell the ECB what to do and what not to do. And yet, this is the result, this is the fruits of its labors. Um, inevitably, taxpayers have been forced to bail out banks. That's entirely um, unnecessary and again shows that the central banks are not out for the public good. Why ask taxpayers to bail out banks? Okay, let's say we've agreed we should bail out banks. Obviously, that's a big if. And we, we may need, well, maybe we shouldn't agree to it, but let's just take that as a starting point. Okay, for some reason, we think we need to bail out banks. There are different options. And using the taxpayer money, public money for this, is the worst of all these options. So it's, just, it's shocking that this is the one they're always going for. Um, let me just go to this actually. So it was the ECB that forced the Irish government to bail out the banks and therefore Ireland moved from being fiscal poster boy to being bankrupt and having to call the IMF in. That was an ECB policy. The ECB could have allowed its offshoot in Ireland, the Irish Central Bank, to solve the problem at zero cost to the, cap to the taxpayer. All you need to do is for the central bank to purchase the non-performing assets of the banks, move them on the central bank balance sheet, then the problem is solved. Because what is a banking crisis? Well, there's an accounting problem with the rigged accounts of the banks. We know they're rigged anyway, and so there's a bit more rigging. Um, and you can, you can simply change the numbers, and the problem is solved. Why should people be unemployed for this? For some bookkeeping problem. Well, don't worry, I'm not advocating to fiddle the books. You can use current accounting rules to solve the problem at zero cost to society. Let me just try to get this. Um, if we look at Japan in the 90s where the banks were bust and then disaster upon disaster happened, um, it started with the banking crisis. Well, there was actually a bigger banking crisis in Japan in 1945. 
the banks were 100% bankrupt. In 1990, 1992, 1993, they were only 25% bankrupt. 25% of the balance sheet was non-performing. As we said, that's of course more than enough to bust the banks because they only have 10% equity or less than 10%. But um, in 1945, 100% of assets were non-performing. Also, in 1945, companies were 100% dependent on banks for funding, whereas in Japan in the 1990s, only 50% or less than 50% of funding came from banks. Capital markets had been growing and expanded. So, in which situation would you expect a longer recession as a result of the banking crisis, the 1990s or 1945, the end of the war? Well, it should have been after 1945. But actually, there was only a two-year recession. Banks already created credit at very fast pace from 1947 for productive purposes. What happened? Well, the central bank bought the non-performing assets from the banks at face value and therefore moved them off the bank balance sheet to the central bank balance sheet. And the problem is solved. And the central bank doesn't even make a loss. Let's say it buys those non-performing assets, which are worth only 20, it buys them for 100. So it looks like the central bank is going to have a loss of 80. But the reality is it has a gain of 20. It gets something that's worth 20. What did it cost the central bank? Well, nothing. It's a central bank. If you had a license to print money, it wouldn't matter so much to you if you bought something slightly over, over the odds, slightly more expensive than, than it should be. Is this going to lead to inflation? Would this lead to inflation? No. No, it doesn't lead to inflation. Because no money is created, actually. Money is created when the banks and the central bank create um, money injected into the non-banking sector. But with this transaction, no money is injected into the non-banking sector. It's just a rebooking between banks and the central bank. They're just, you know, cleaning up the accounts. So no money is injected into the non-banking sector. There is, it's impossible to create inflation with this. This is evidenced by the Federal Reserve, which did this in 2008. That explains why in the U.S., despite the fact that the 2008 crisis started in the U.S., and that was where the crisis was, was uh, most... Um, significant in, in many respects. Despite that, banks have been lending already since 2011 at a very fast pace, 4 or 5% bank credit growth, whereas in Europe, um, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Greece, minus 10% and so on for years and years still ongoing. So the reason is the Federal Reserve did just that, did what the Bank of Japan did in 1945. It, bought non-performing assets off the banks, off the balance sheet. So its own balance sheet quadrupled. So a lot of people thought, well, the dollar is going to collapse. Well, it didn't. It rose. Why? It doesn't create money. That's misleading. It's just, you know, central bank balance sheets, you know, you have to know how to read them. The central banks, of course, can manipulate the balance sheets at, at will. And this transaction doesn't actually inject real money into the economy. So why should there be inflation? There wasn't any. Why should there be a weaker dollar, dollar strength? Um, of course, the central bank that pioneered this was the Bank of England, the pioneer of central banks, most of its history privately owned. And the Bank of England did this in August 1914. What happened in August 1914? The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland declared war on Germany and her allies. It turns out that the city hadn't thought this through and several big banks in the city of London were bankrupt immediately. Why? Well, Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, all these imperial states, um, and also the Ottoman Empire, and they were allies. They were doing a lot of their trade, international trade and finance, through the world's financial center, London. So London banks held a lot of their um, bills and notes 
and all that, of course, had to be deemed um, in default because you could not legally now claim that money because it was a state of war. So several banks were bankrupt and the Bank of England thought it's not a good moment to have a banking crisis and have large-scale unemployment. So no, we're not going to have that. Therefore, we'll just solve the problem at zero cost to anyone, uh, more or less overnight, by buying those non-performing assets. Not in market value, but something close to face value, problem solved. So if central banks want to avoid recessions emerging from central banks, then they know how to do it. But this is not what the ECB did. The ECB insists that the Irish government, the taxpayer, Irish people come up with the money to bail out these big banks. Because as you know, in Iceland, people um, had a revolt against this and refused to bail out the banks. And what happened? Well, they did quite well. So this, this is something that makes me very cautious, to put it mildly, um, about the idea to give more power to central banks in concentrating um, you know, this allocation decision. Now, the other point I want to make is, what about um, other activities of the ECB? Currently, the ECB is engaged in a war to destroy the 1,500, 1,600 community banks in Germany and also Austria and other countries where there's also still a few left. Why is that? Why am I saying this? Well, number one, since 2008, the EU massively increased bank regulation and the burden of bank regulation. Almost every year there's a 600, 800 page new document coming out that all the banks have to implement, which is pretty um, incredible, a task facing a small community bank with maybe 10 staff or 15 staff. They just don't have the resources. They have to hire full-time staff now in, in this new reporting requirement, handing in you know, regular reports and this, that and the other, because the EU makes no distinction between the big banks and the small banks. You go to the U.S. where you have all bank sizes and also a lot of small banks. The small banks get, it, get their own regulator and the regulatory burden is very light because they're small. It's very reasonable and sensible. But the EU um, is using the same uh, rules for the, the, the world's largest banks as it's using for a, a German community bank with 10 staff. Can you believe it? So they have to close. And this is what's currently happening. So in the next five years, there won't be 1,600. We're lucky if there'll be 600. The other way they're killing them is the interest rate policy of the ECB. So it, it lowered the short-term interest rate to zero, and it's pushing the long-term interest rates, it's been pushing them to zero through its purchase program, asset purchase program, which is just making the speculators richer but doesn't help the economy. So you've got a zero uh, interest rate and a flat yield curve. Now productive lending by you know, the good banks lending for productive purposes really works when you have a bit of a positive yield curve. You know, short-term interest rates are lower, long-term interest rates are higher, which is the normal situation. But now we've got flat, a flat yield curve at zero. So banks that lend for productive purposes are the ones that are killed by this. They, they can't survive. They're actually now forced to do what the big banks are doing. They don't mind this because they use the money for speculation anyway. And when you do this QE, purchasing assets, pushing down interest rates, you are fueling another asset bubble that the big banks are happy to speculate in, which is what's happening. Now they're forcing also community banks to move into asset lending because otherwise they have to close quicker. So they're creating a property bubble in Germany um, through this policy, but they are um, forcing the community banks to merge. Um, so that there's a merger mania now happening under this pressure, 
and this is their way of, of destroying these banks before other countries introduce the system. The central banks are also currently waging a war on cash. They've been used, introducing negative interest rates in a number of countries and they argue that that's good because you know, with interest rates we can stimulate the economy. If zero rates are not enough, well, we have negative rates to stimulate the economy. Because lower rates lead to higher growth. Well, this has never been true. This claim that lower rates result in, um, in higher growth. Firstly, about negative rates. Negative rates are imposed by central banks in several countries now, such as Switzerland and Denmark. Um, on banks. So it's for these reserves held by banks at the central bank. They say now you have to pay a fee essentially. It's like a tax on the banks. And what are banks going to do? They're less profitable. They're going to pass it on to their customers. And we've seen this in Switzerland very clearly. Since they introduced negative interest rates to allegedly stimulate the economy, borrowing rates, interest rates, that have to be paid by borrowers have been rising. So it's strange that central banks insist on this policy. Um, but there's a second reason why this has always been nonsense because there's no evidence that lower interest rates stimulate the economy at any time. Lower rates do not stimulate the economy. Likewise, higher rates do not slow an economy. This this idea that the price of money is a key macroeconomic tool and that you know, lower rates lead to higher growth, higher rates lead to lower growth, um, is actually one of the central tenets in, in modern macroeconomics. And it's been repeated so many times that most people think, well, surely that's been tested, proven hundreds of times, thousands of times in all sorts of studies. But no. There is no evidence for this claim whatsoever. If you look at the data, what you find is that you've got interest rates on the vertical axis and nominal GDP growth on the horizontal. There's a positive correlation. So more growth goes hand in hand with higher interest rates. Japanese data, you can use US data, more growth, higher interest rates. Look at the leads and lags. Which one comes first? The official story is rates happen first, they move the economy. The economy follows on the, the action of the rates. Well, the empirical evidence shows the statistical causation, the, ti the, the timing, it's the other way around. So look at Japan. Um, the pink line here is nominal GDP. It started to rise significantly in 87. It took two years for interest rates to rise. Then GDP fell and interest rates follow. This is true also for the US. This is now uh, bond yields. Even the most liquid securities market in the world, the US Treasury market, shows that it follows the economy. Interest rates follow the economy. So first GDP decelerates, growth falls. Then with a big time lag, almost a year, interest rates fall. GDP rises, then interest rates rise, then GDP decelerates again, then interest rates fall. So. Um, the official story that high rates lead to low growth and low rates lead to high growth um, is contradicted by reality it's the other way around in two dimensions. High growth leads to high rates, low growth leads to low interest rates. That of course raises the question, well, if rates are not uh, what's driving the economy, what is it? Well, you know the answer to that. It's not the price of money, it's the quantity of money. And what is money? It's bank credit. That's what's driving the economy. Bank credit for GDP transactions, and you can show this statistically very clearly, drives nominal GDP. So why do central bankers keep repeating the mantra that they use interest rates as policy tool? It cannot possibly be a policy tool because it follows the economy. Next time they lower rates, it's because they've ensured through their credit policies that the economy is going down and rates follow that, that's all. Essentially, interest rates are to distract you and to confuse people and hide the truth of how the economy operates and what central banks are doing.
because with interest rates they will always try to argue, look, we're working really hard to create a recovery. The Bank of Japan for you know, over 20 years has tried very hard to get a recovery. Well, it just didn't work. Tough, isn't it? Well, no, they have not tried hard at all. It's been the Bank of Japan that has prolonged the recession, and that's what central banks do. And that's why we have to be very careful about giving any more power to central banks. We have to do the opposite, take power away from central banks. You see this, and this is my last point. Um, in the current central bank war on cash that's going on, why are central banks adopting the policy of negative rates? Since negative rates cannot cause an economic recovery, they actually raise borrowing rates as we saw, and they hurt banks, they kill community banks, therefore you get less SME lending, you know, it's just totally the opposite. Um, central bankers have at the same time been reflating asset bubbles, helping the big banks and financial speculators. So you clearly see whose side they're on. And of course, historically, all central banks have been um, in the past, if you go back to before the Second World War, all central banks had been created by banks, by the big banks, big banking groups created the central banks. They're their creature. And it seems that even the ECB, which is a much more recent construct, is fully captured by, by big banks. I mean, you know, you've got a Goldman Sachs guy hitting it. Now, the central banks argue that, oh, with this, you know, so, interest, so they just insist, you know, interest rates will stimulate the economy, but that's why we're trying to have negative rates. And to make this work, we need to abolish cash. Why? Well, because, of course, people, you know, because with negative rates, ultimately, they'll ask us to, to pay fines, and they just reduce the money in our deposit accounts, right? Negative rates. But, of course, if that happens, people will leave withdraw their money and put it in, move into cash, obviously. Um, therefore, cash should be abolished. That is the convoluted logic. Now, that is one of the goals. So they're even willing to adopt this nonsensical negative interest rate just so that they can have a reason to argue we need to abolish cash, you see. Because that would then leave the central banks completely in control. Digital cash centrally controlled by the central banks we are talking about a totalitarian regime here. And this would be the culmination of the 20th century agenda to centralize power in ever more power in the hands of fewer and fewer, which clearly has not been good for people anywhere. What we need to do is the opposite and work against this trend um, towards a decentralized a decentralization in general of, of all systems but clearly the monetary system and banking is at the core of the problems and therefore we need to introduce a decentralized banking system and to me that means, well, community banks controlled by local communities because then they're also accountable. As soon as an organization gets too large, it's very hard to make it accountable. And, as, and something as important as money creation therefore needs to be broken up into many small community banks, um, they are accountable to local communities, and you can keep a tab on that. And we, we see this um, when, when we have a community banking system with many small banks, with only two directors and you know ten staff, they can't do anything without everyone in the in the local um, communities knowing what's going on. And so they are accountable, and then you get sensible lending for projects that people want. And the bankers in these community banks know, well, we can't do that because you know, everyone's going to hate it. And so they're not going to do these horrible projects which the big banks love to implement. There's much more in, in some of my books. Uh, the Princes of the Yen is also out as a documentary on YouTube, so you can watch it uh, freely. If you just go to YouTube and put in Princes of the Yen movie, you'll see it. Um, this is particularly about this theme of the dangers of the centralization of power in the hands of, of the central banks. I've got a few more things, um, but I, I'm afraid I'm already totally running over here. Um, perhaps just one sentence if I'm allowed. Um, what, well, I tried to get the, the Irish um, 
finance department to adopt this policy to stimulate the Irish economy by doing something very, very simple. No extra money, not even the central bank needed for this. Something the finance department can do. Perhaps you know you can all demand this from, from the Irish government. They need to stop the issuance of government bonds and instead borrow from banks in Ireland. Then you get bank credit creation for GDP transactions. Of course, it's a stopgap measure, but it will boost nominal GDP uh, and employment because what they're currently doing is they are um, just helping the big banks, which are bond underwriters, by issuing bonds, but that crowds out the, um, the private sector, essentially. So this is a policy that could be implemented in Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Greece. Um, bank loan contracts are non-tradable and therefore they beat bonds as an instrument funding, also in terms of attractiveness for banks. Um, the sovereign debt crisis, which has been a big problem in Spain, Portugal, Greece, um, can be solved very easily if governments didn't borrow through bonds at all, but borrowed from banks, namely the money creators. Bonds don't create money. If you look at just the, the data, um, the interest rates on the bonds have been much higher, of course, than interest rates from banks. So the Greek government had bond yields between 20% and 60%, but they could have borrowed instead from the banks, which create the money and therefore expand the money supply, at less than 4%, but they didn't. Isn't that funny? Ireland, so in, in 2011, the bond yields were 12% and the government raised money at 12% while at the same time um, the interest rate charged by banks to, for their best customers, which the government would be, um, even in that situation, uh, was less than 4%. But they didn't do it, you see, because they're in the pockets of the big banks and the bond underwriters. So there's many things we need to push for, but I've, I've already taken a lot of your time. So thank you very much. Thank you.